All right, how's it going? Welcome back to another video here in the series on group theory. In the last video, we talked all about these things called group actions, right? And it's sort of the, it was the first video in the, the new section. And the, the purpose of the last video was just to introduce what a group action is. And because it's gonna be so important, not only for, for this video, but obviously the entire section, because that's the, the name of the section, right? I want to quickly go over what we covered in the last video, just to make sure that we have a very clear understanding of what's going on. Right. So the, the basic idea, and what we started with, is that group theory can be thought of as a study of symmetries. And because of that, the, the natural idea behind a group action is that a group action is the mechanism which allows us to relate an element of a group to a corresponding symmetry of a set. And, and that's what the, really the definition of a group action was, right? We said that a group action is a homomorphism, which we called phi, and it takes in elements of a group, which we can call little g, and spits out some corresponding element of a symmetric group, which we can call sigma. But what we, we did additionally is we said, okay, well, let's not just stop there, even if that makes sense, because we want to remind ourselves that sigma itself as even though this is an element of the symmetric group, sigma itself is a permutation. It is a function or a bijection going from the set X into itself. So let, let's, let's take the next step then, right? We can say if we have two elements of this set X, and we can call it little x and little y, then sigma could take an X and spit out Y. That's a possible uh, mapping that, that sigma could have. So once we have this idea set in place, and then, and then this idea as well, we, we then combine them together to say that the group action phi acts on g, and this quantity by itself, phi of g, produces sigma, but then sigma of x equals y. So then if you were to write it out in a single line, this is what you would get. You would get that phi of g of x equals y. And even though that is the step-by-step process as to what is really going on, you can imagine that that can be a little bit unintuitive and, and especially when we start to, to get into concepts in this video, we'll see that working with a more compact notation it tends to be a little bit easier to, to grasp some of the concepts at least. And because of that, we introduced this shorthand notation right here where rather than writing phi of g of x, we omit the literal group action phi, and we simply just write g of x equals y. Okay. And again, the, the reason why I would like to stress this is because this is the notation that we are going to be using in this video and the majority of the rest of the, the, the videos on, on group actions. But if we only think of a group action like this, and when we look at this notation that I boxed here in the literal sense, it looks like g is a function. It's like g is a function which has takes in elements little x, or it takes in an element from the set x and spits out another element little y, which is also an element of the set x. So if we just look at that notation literally, it looks like this is what is going on. And the, the answer is, well, well, not really, right? What's really going on is, is this, this uh, sort of long term notation right here. And that, that's why we spent all that time in the last video establishing this, is because we wanna say, let's have a strong foundation for what a group action is. But if we can make the connection that this means the same thing as this, then even though this might not be, I guess, correct in the literal, sense, uh, it is still going to be the simpler and more straightforward notation to work with going forwards. Okay. So, so hopefully the, everything that I said here is clear um, because uh, we, we're going to keep going. We're going to say, let's now, assuming that we understand what a group action is, let's now go forward and start to talk about various properties of group actions. And one of the, the big results in the this section here is what we're going to be talking about in this video. It turns out that once we introduce what a group action is, there is a very big theorem in group theory 
which you might be able to tell what the name of the theorem is by the title of, of the video. And, and what we're going to be doing in this video is developing uh, all the tools necessary to understand the theorem. And if we have enough time where the video doesn't feel like it's going on long enough, we'll, we'll prove the theorem at the very end. Okay. That's called the orbit stabilizer theorem. So in case uh, we were unaware of that. So hopefully all that makes sense. First thing though, to, to talk about the orbit stabilizer theorem is the, the two words that come before theorem. <laughs> there are orbits and stabilizers. And we want to know what both of these ideas are. So what I'm going to first do is probably introduce orbits because that comes first in orbit stabilizer. <laughs> so I'll write out the definition for what orbit is right here and then we're going to unpack that together. Okay, so we have the definition here for an orbit, uh, first part of the orbit uh, stabilizer theorem, right? So let's go through this definition together. It says, given an action G or of, of a group G on a set X, then the orbit of an element in the set X is going to be denoted by this guy right here, okay? So first thing, before we even dive into this, the, uh, the orbit, once, once we have an action, right, a group action, G on X, then the orbit corresponds to a set element. So every element of the, the set has an orbit, but we are not saying that every element of the group has an orbit. So that's kind of the, when, when we talk about these things like orbits and stabilizers, it's always important to, to have a notion in our head of, okay, what does this thing correspond to? And, and that's the, the first thing we want to establish, that every set element, every element in our set X has a, an associated orbit. Now, there are two notations to describe uh, the orbit of a set element. First, we could just write the word orb, which I, I personally like this one, uh, say orb of the element. Another way is to write uppercase G acting on X. And this one might seem a little bit more uh, arbitrary, like why uppercase G acting on X. And I, I think that while writing orb of X is, is kind of fun, I think G of X, writing it like this, provides a, a more intuitive or a more natural notation as to what is going on mathematically. So let's now get into what the, the orbit of an element actually is, this set right here. So the orbit of an element is a set, and it is the set of other elements in the set is a set of y elements in the set x, such that g, little g of x ends up mapping to y, okay? And this might be a little bit confusing at first, but, but I think if we explain it a little bit, it'll be uh, relatively intuitive. So let's, let's suppose that if we're looking at the orbit of an element x, if I were to take one of the elements of my group, maybe I can call it G, and I have G act on X, maybe it spits out another element of the set Y, like this, right? So this is one possibility in the main notation that we've been using so far, but let's now extend this just a little bit. Let's say that this group G right here has another element, H, and this element were to act on X, and maybe when H acts on X, maybe we don't get Y, but we get a different set element, a different element in here called Z. So, and, and you can imagine that if we were to write out all the possible group elements acting on this set, what the orbit of this element is, is simply the codomain right here. It's the set of elements that X can possibly map to. Okay. And, and the reason why I think I like this notation right here, uppercase G of X, is because if, if we were to say uh, little g of X like this, or H of X, that's referring to one element of the group acting on X and spitting out one element of the orbit. But, but the, the orbit is simply all of the possible values that uh, X can get mapped to. Or in other words, if we were to take all the elements of the group and just write big G, 
if all elements of the group act on x, where is it, what is the possible set that, that the entire group can, can map to? And, and hence why I think this notation is a bit more intuitive, even though I think this is the more fun notation, at least. Okay. So, so hopefully that makes sense, at least conceptually, that the orbit of an element is all the possible other elements in the set that, that x can, can possibly map to. Okay. Now, just one more way of, of thinking about it, because while well, well, uppercase g of x, I think, is a very good notation mathematically to describe an orbit, uh, I, I like the phrase orb. I think it's just a fun little phrase. And I also think that the, the phrase or the term orbit is, is kind of a, a fun way of, of imagining or just coming up with a visual sort of intuitive picture as to what could possibly be going on. And maybe to, to do this, th this is not mathematically rigorous, but, but this is more just for fun and how I like to think of orbits is, is I like to kind of imagine maybe we have a planet and, uh, or, or maybe, yeah, let's call this the sun. We're, we're working our solar system now. I mean, we have the sun in the center and then maybe we have little earth that is doing its orbit around the sun like this. One way of describing the Earth's orbit around the sun is to say, what are all the possible areas in space that Earth is able to reach? Extending that analogy to here, if we were to just replace Earth with the set element X, and then maybe this ring right here, let, let me say this is little x, I'll, I'll really try to make the distinction, little x. And then the, the ring or, or the, the, that it orbits around the sun is the overall set, big X. Then as, as the planet orbits around here, that's like saying what other elements in this circle can this element possibly reach when acted on? by a given group, okay? So, so by thinking of, of a set element as a planet and it's in its own little orbit, it's, it's like saying what other areas or what other elements of our set big X can, can it possibly reach? I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's useful or not, but, but personally that's the way I think of orbits. I just think it's a fun little picture to describe it rather than just this uh, general mathematical set right here. So ho hopefully, wh whether this is more useful or whether this or this is more useful, hopefully we are able to understand what an orbit is. That, that is the main idea, okay? Now, again, this is simply the, the first piece in the orbit stabilizer theorem. We also need to cover what a stabilizer is, right? So what I'm gonna do now is probably just erase everything but the, the definition here. And I'm gonna write out what a stabilizer is down here and then we're gonna go through that together. Okay, so now we have the definition for a stabilizer right here. So let's uh, talk about that. So it says that uh, first thing, same, like the orbit corresponds to a given set element. Same idea with the stabilizer. Uh, there, for every given element of our set X, that element has a, an associated stabilizer with it. And there are two notations to describe the stabilizer of an element. And the first is really the fun one, just like here, which uh, we, we write stab for the, the short, uh, short term notation of stabilizer. Um, and, but, but probably the, the better mathematical notation or the one that, that makes more mathematical sense, I guess, is, is this notation where we have uh, the, the group and then a subscript whatever element we're working with. And to understand why this notation right here probably makes a little more sense mathematically, let's go through what this actual set is right here. So the stabilizer of X is inherently going to be the group elements, which when they act on X, essentially don't do anything and produce just X as the output, okay? And what, what, what the stabilizer intuitively corresponds to, I, I, and I think the name is, is very intuitive, is it corresponds to the group elements which 
which uh, keep this the set element x in a sense stable. Basically, if we had x before some sort of action g, then then uh, even after the action g, it stays in like its same position. We would sort of consider x uh, to, to be stable when acted on by this specific g, right? Because if, if when g acts on x, we get x, we could think of this as like the stable thing, like x is not moving. Whereas if we had a different group element acting on x and all of a sudden we get y now, now it feels like x is not stable under this specific group action, right? It's like it, it got transformed or it got moved after it tried to get acted on. So the, that's how we can kind of intuitively think of the, the, the stabilizer. And the reason why I like this notation, despite this one being more fun, in my opinion, is that it, it looks like when we write G, that inherently talks about group elements, right? We, we, it, it looks like we are writing out elements of a group. And that's, that's what we're working with when we have a stabilizer. The stabilizer of an element is inherently looking at group elements. And that's different than with the orbit, which is inherently looking at set elements. And that might be an, an important distinction to make right here. Because the orbit of x, well, let's maybe even write this. The orbit of x, if, if it's a set of uh, set elements, we could say that the orbit of x is a subset of the overall set big X. Whereas the stabilizer of this element x is not a subset of the set, but rather the stabilizer is a subset of the group. Okay. So, so they are subsets of different inherent quantities, and that, that's important to keep in mind. Now, what we're often used to in this video series is not writing subsets of groups, but we're used to thinking of, of things as subgroups of groups. But really all we're saying right now with, with the stabilizer is that the stabilizer just is the, the set of group elements that satisfy this property, that keep X stable or keep X fixed. Uh, so, so that's why we're writing a subset symbol rather than, rather than a subgroup symbol. But it turns out that what we're going to want to do next is to just look at some basic properties of, of orbits and stabilizers. And, and the, the one that I, I want to introduce right away is that we don't need to write just a subset symbol. It turns out that the stabilizer of an element is actually a subgroup of an overall group. And that might not seem like a surprise if, if we're, it seems like if we're talking about these things, it most likely has some more structure to it besides just being an arbitrary subset, right? It, it turns out this happens to be a subgroup. But we should go through proving that, right? So I think what I'm going to do is, is to maybe just erase this right here. We'll prove the, that statement that the stabilizer is inherently a subgroup of a group. And then we'll, we'll continue from there. Okay, so let's prove that the stabilizer of X is inherently going to be a subgroup of G. And maybe actually right before we prove this, one I think really interesting thing about this claim that, that we have not mentioned yet is that there is a different stable there's a stabilizer associated with each set element but this is just a general set element right so it turns out for every element of the set there's going to be a corresponding stabilizer and every one of those stabilizers happens to be a subgroup of our group All right so, so this is not like just one single uh, subgroup. We are finding a multitude of subgroups depending on whatever element we plug in uh, X for, or whatever element we plug into to here. Okay. But let's actually go through proving this. Hopefully we remember the, the way that we can show that something is a subgroup. And maybe I'll write it up here real quickly. If we have a subgroup H of G, it needs to satisfy two criteria. The first is that H is non-empty, 
And we talked about the, the subgroup criteria relatively early on in the video series, but I believe we've talked about this at, at some point. And then the second is that if we have two elements A and B in our subgroup, then we would need to show that the corresponding quantity AB inverse, the, the product AB inverse is also in the subgroup. So we're just gonna go through those two criteria and then that will show that the stabilizer of X is inherently a subgroup of G. Okay. So first one, we need to show that H is non-empty. So how do we do that, right? Well, we, we know that if, if this is the notation that we are using when talking about a group action, like this general, or G of X equals Y, we know that one possible element of a group is going to be the identity element, right? And the identity element is gonna have the property that if we take any input set element X, we're going to get the exact same value as its output, okay? So we know that whatever element X we're talking about, that the identity element of the group is always inherently going to be an element of the stabilizer. Therefore, the stabilizer is not empty. All right, so, so that would check off this first requirement right here. Then for the, the second requirement, we're gonna start by supposing that there are two elements in our stabilizer. So let's maybe do that over here. Let's say that I have G and H, and these are inherently elements of our sub, group, so they're, in, let's do this, they're inherently elements of stab of X. I'm going to typically refer to these two as stab of X and orb of X, just because I think that's it's kind of fun. What we the need to show is, is that, that GH inverse is in stab of X. So if we were to, let's write this out now. So now we have GH inverse acting on X like this. First thing that we're going to need to do is we need to say, what is H inverse acting on X? Well, we know that if H is an element of the stabilizer, that it needs to satisfy the property that it keeps X fixed or keeps X stable, right? It needs to have the property that H of X equals X. What you can imagine us doing now is, is kind of just taking the inverse of both sides of this equation, multiplying to the left on both sides by H inverse h inverse of x like this. And we know the inverse exists because h is a group element, right? So it has to have an inverse. Then what we get is that h inverse h cancels, and then the left-hand side simply becomes x, and the right-hand side becomes h inverse of x. So what we see is that if h is an element of the stabilizer, then h inverse is also an element of the stabilizer. And that's important because if H inverse is an element of the stabilizer, then H inverse of X is just going to equal X. It keeps X stable or fixed. So G H, or let's say that G H inverse of X is the same as G of just X by itself. And then let's just go one step further, right? If we know that G is an element of the stabilizer, then G is going to keep X stable or fixed. So G of X is going to equal X. Then you just put everything together, right? And then you say that GH inverse of X equals X. Therefore, GH inverse is going to be an element of the stabilizer. And that would check off the second criteria, subgroup criteria right here. So because the two subgroup criteria are satisfied, we can then say, therefore, the stabilizer of any element of the set must be a subgroup of the overall group hopefully makes sense. Now, at, at this point, in, in Dexter's notes, he says, let's now go through some examples of looking at group actions or a group acting on a set and just to say, what is the orbit of a given element and what is the stabilizer of that given element? And I, I think that's gonna be useful too because eventually we wanna work up to the orbit stabilizer theorem, but, um, but, but I think just getting some concrete examples as to, to what these ideas are, rather than these general definitions or these sort of intuitive pictures of planets orbiting suns in our heads, right? 
So I think I, I, I like that approach. What I'm going to do next is uh, erase the board, and then we're going to go through some of the examples to get a, a more concrete idea as to what orbits and stabilizers are in specific cases. Okay, so we have an example right here. And I, I think what I wanted to do, initially when I was recording this, I wanted to do multiple examples, but going back, I think for the, the sake of time, so this video doesn't extend too long, I'd rather just go through one example, but really make sure that we, we understand the details of it, uh, just for the, the sake of time, okay? So when, when talking about a group action, or a group acting on a set, we need to talk about, well, first, what is that group and what is the set that it is acting on? So the, the group here is going to be G, uh, or I should say the group G is going to be D8, the dihedral group, which corresponds to the symmetries of a four-sided, a regular four-sided polygon, aka a square, which we have right here. And maybe let's even just write out the elements real quick. We're going to have E, R, R squared, R cubed, S, R, S, R squared S, and R cubed S, like this. Then for the set that it is acting on, let's just have it, if these are the symmetries of a square, let's have it act on a square, where the, the set that we are interested in is inherently just going to be the set of the four corners of the square right here. And we can represent the four corners of the square symbolically by the numbers 1, 2, 3, and 4. And the goal in this example is to say, okay, what is the orbit and stabilizer of a given element of the set or of a given corner on the square? Okay, so it doesn't matter which corner we choose, maybe we can just choose corner one to stay consistent with Dexter's notes. And we want to find the orbit and the stabilizer of the top left corner of the square. Right. And let's start with the, the orbit. I mean, it doesn't matter, right? But let's, let's start with the orbit. The orbit is all the possible locations on the square that the top left corner could map to or could orbit to. And hopefully it makes sense that if the dihedral group D8 contains four rotations and then four reflections, that just by looking at the rotational elements alone, being E, R, R squared, and R cubed, that the, the orbit of the top left corner is simply going to be the entire square by itself. But in case we don't see that, let's actually go through this in, in detail, step by step. So if we were to start with this identity element acting on the top left corner, or in other words, we had E acting on one, we know that the identity element acting on one is just going to, that is the do nothing symmetry, right? That is if we took the square and did nothing with it, that leaves the square symmetric. And, and this was kind of the example element to show that the stabilizer is inherently non-empty. All right. So if we know that the identity symmetry takes the top left corner into itself, then one possible location that the top left corner could move is nowhere, right? It could move to the, the, the same top left corner, that top left location right there. Now, may, let's suppose uh, with this next element R, that maybe R corresponds to a 90 degree rotation in the counterclockwise direction. Then if that was the case, when R acts on the top of this corner, this vertex right here, the 90 degree rotation is going to take this vertex and move it down to here. So we would say that R of 1 equals 3. So then we would also say, okay, it looks like the top left corner is able to get mapped to the bottom left corner through the R rotation element. And then hopefully we can fill in the other two cases as well, right? If we perform two of those rotations, R squared on this vertex, one rotation goes here, the second one goes here. So r squared of 1 is going to give us 4. And then finally, r cubed of 1 is going to give us the remaining spot of 2. Right, so, so then we could say this is the orbit right here. There are also four 
reflection elements, but, but because all of the possible locations, all the possible corners of the square are already covered, and because there's no sense of uh, ordering of the elements of a set, it doesn't matter how we write this comma separated list. Without even going through the reflection elements, we don't have to, we automatically know that the orbit of the top left corner is simply gonna be the entire set X by itself. You notice this is, these are the same two sets right here. So this is just gonna be X. And hopefully that makes sense, right? This top corner can orbit to any of the other corners based off of the symmetries of the dihedral group, D8. All right, now let's go on to, to the stabilizer. In other words, what group elements now are going to keep this top left corner fixed? And it, it's, it's gonna be worth going, going through this, uh, I think step by step to really see how this works here. So we automatically know that the identity element, when it acts on, that's the do nothing symmetry, we know that it will be an element of whatever stabilizer we're working with. So we know the identity has to be in the stabilizer, but now let's just consider the other rotations for a second. Whether we consider R, R squared, or R cubed, we know that each of these rotation elements take the number one into a different corresponding output element. So what we see is that it seems like these other rotation elements do not keep one fixed or do not keep one stable. So because of that, none of the rotation elements are gonna be in the stabilizer. So then what we'd have to do is we'd say, okay, well, if there are any other stabilizer elements, they're gonna be in these four remaining elements right here. Now, each of these are reflections about a given axis. And we could say that, uh, we, we could choose the axis arbitrarily, in a sense, kind of like how we chose the rotation element to be a rotation 90 degrees in the counterclockwise direction. We could make a similar arbitrary choice with the reflection element. Just to be very general to show how this works, I, I'm gonna do that. Let's suppose that S is a reflection about this axis right here then what you can imagine is that if we were to perform S, let's do this down here, if we were to perform S on the number one, it will get reflected, it will keep two and three fixed, right, if we reflect about this axis, but one's gonna move to four and four is gonna move to one. So when S acts on the number one, a single reflection takes us to four. So this reflection right here would not be part of the stabilizer. It does not keep the number one stable. So then we would just ask ourselves what, which of these remaining elements would keep the number one stable. So in other words, after we've performed the reflection, now four is up here and one is down here. How many counterclockwise rotations would we need in order to bring the number one back up here? Well, we would need two, right? We would need one rotation to get to here and a second one to get to its original starting position. That corresponds to the element R squared S. And it turns out that's the only one, right? I mean, RS would bring the number one right here and R cubed S would bring the number one down here. So this right here would be the stabilizer of the number one. And hopefully it makes sense that this is inherently a subgroup of D8. Now, just to be uh, very thorough in this, if we were to all of a sudden say that the S element rather than being a reflection across this axis right here, is instead a reflection across this axis. Maybe, let me even just cross this axis where this is the number one. Then if we were to look at the stabilizer of one, here, let me make a little more room. If we were to look at the stabilizer of one, where this is how the S element is defined, then we would still have the identity element. But then also you can imagine if we were to perform just a single reflection, that because it's about this axis, the, the, the top left corner is gonna stay fixed under this reflection. Or in other words, the top left corner and the bottom right corner are both gonna still be stable. Therefore, S by itself would be the second element of the stabilizer if this is how we define the reflection. 
And this is kind of interesting too. You notice that regardless of how we define the reflection element, that we still that we would get different stabilizers, but both of these are going to be subgroups of the overall dihedral group D8. You can show that these are both isomorphic to C2, the cyclic group C2. Okay, so hopefully this makes sense. This is how we can obtain all the, 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 the places it could go, how we could obtain its orbit, and which elements keep the uh, given corner stable. Now, what, what I'd like to do is I want to keep diving into properties, though, on orbits and stabilizers, assuming that, that this right here makes sense. Okay. So I'm going to erase the board, and then we're going to write out the, the next claim that we're really going to need as a tool to help us establish the orbit stabilizer theorem. Okay, so interesting property here. It turns out that the orbits of an action end up partitioning the set. All right. and, and, and this is going to be very important in the, the orbit stabilizer theorem, why I'm calling it a lemma. It's an important result leading up to that theorem. Okay. So, so let's go about just proving this. And th this, this might sound familiar to when we would say that the cosets of a subgroup partition a group, right? When we were talking about Lagrange's theorem. And it turns out that there are some, some similarities in this. But, but the, the statement that we're making, we still want to be clear, is, is different than that. We are inherently talking about a set X. So if this rectangular box right here is my set X, then the various orbits are going to be subsets of this set. And maybe if, if, if I were to divide X up into this, this uh, arrangement of six different uh, subspaces right here, then, then we could say that these are six different possible orbits. So that's what we ideally want to show. Now let's, additionally too, let's remind ourselves what does it mean to partition a set? That tells us that we are splitting it up into various chunks where each element in the overall rectangle, each element in the overall set belongs to exactly one of these uh, possible subsets. So in other words, there's not a single element that's left out of all of the, all of the uh, subsets, and there aren't any overlapping subsets, meaning there aren't any elements that are in more than one subset. Okay. So again, that's what it means to partition a set. And one more thing before we get started. When we were talking about left cosets of a subgroup partitioning a group back when we were talking about Lagrange's theorem, we also showed that each of the cosets had the same size. But keep in mind that when we are talking about a partition, a partition makes no mention of requiring that each of these sub boxes right here have the same size. That is a separate result. So if, if I start with these six boxes and then I were to just add this little box right here, so now I guess I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pieces of this whole rectangle, even though these pieces don't have the same size, this would still be a valid partition on the set X. Okay, so, so I really just want to make sure we're keeping these concepts clear and we're not trying to, uh, to, to make too many connections that aren't actually there. Now, let's, let's actually prove the thing though, right? First thing, how do, we, how do we show that every element in our set X belongs to at least one orbit? How do we know that there's uh, an element that's not getting left out of any orbit. And the, the way that we know that is that for, let's suppose that we have some element in our set, little x. We know that little x needs to be in its own respective orbit. So x is in the orbit of x. Why is that true? Because the orbit of x is, is going to say all possible places that that X could map to if we act all group elements on little x, right? Well, one of those group elements is inherently going to be the identity element acting on X. And we know that the identity acting on X just gives us X. So one possible location that X could go is just its original location. Therefore, every element is in its own orbit, meaning that every element belongs to at least one uh, orbit. And that would be the first part of this say, okay, good. Then we would just have to show the second part of this to say that 
not only is every element a part of at least one orbit, but also every element is a part of at most one orbit. There is not an element that can exist in multiple orbits at the same time. And it, here's how we can show that. Let's, for example, for a minute, suppose that X, or rather, to use just some different notation, let, let's suppose that there's another element in our set Z, and Z is an element of this orbit, so Z is an element of the orbit of X. And let's suppose that Z is also, so right, and Z is an element of the orbit of Y. So supposedly there's this element that belongs to two different orbits. The only way this is gonna happen where we don't have a contradiction is if these are actually, in, in fact, the same orbit. So, so in other words, the only way this could not lead to a contradiction would be if the orbit of X is equal to the orbit of Y. In other words, these two subs or yeah, these two subsets are in fact the same set. Now the way that we're going to show this, and this is what we're going to try to show to finish off the proof, but the way that we're going to show this is that the orbit of X is a subset of the orbit of Y and vice versa. And if one subset, I'm saying a subset of a subset, if this is a subset of this, and if this is a subset of this, they are equal. Okay, that's, that's, that's the idea and that's the strategy that, that we're going to use. Okay. Now, let's, let's use our starting assumption. We're going to assume Z is in these two orbits right here. So if Z is in the orbit of X, that means Z is one possible location that X could get mapped to under some group element. Let's call that group element G1, just to be general. So we can say when G1 acts on X, it maps it orbits it or moves it over to this new element Z. That's what it means for Z to be in the orbit of X. And then same thing in the orbit of Y. If, if Z is in the orbit of Y, then Z is equal to some other element, G2, acting on Y. Then you can just see by the transitive property, if this is Z and if this is Z, then this is this. These two are equal. Or in other words, G1 of X equals G2 of Y, like this. And, and at this point, what we, what we can do is because we're working with group elements, we know that G2 has an inverse. So we can multiply both sides of this equation on the left by G2 inverse. And when we do that, the left-hand side becomes G2 inverse G1 acting on X. And the right-hand side becomes G2 inverse G2, or just those cancel out to give us Y by itself. So this is a relation that that can be formed, okay? And notice this could work the other way around too, right? We could say that X is equal to, that would be G1 inverse G2 of Y. So, so this argument's gonna work both ways and that's gonna be important, all right? Now, how do, how do we continue from here? What, what we can say is, is, let's just generally suppose that right now we know that Z is an element of the orbit of Y Let's just say there's some other element in the orbit of Y, some other location that Y could possibly map to. Let, let's call that location W. So if W is now in the orbit of Y, um, maybe I'll write stuff over here. I, I hope this is not gonna get too confusing. I have some stuff here and we'll go over here. Let's say that we're gonna let W be in the orbit of Y meaning that there's some group element, which I can maybe just call G3, acting on Y that maps to W. Or what I, I think I want to do is I want to put W first. Let's do this. The W equals G3 of Y. Then what I can do is I can say, well, I know Y is equal to G2 inverse G1 of X. So let's just replace the Y right here with, with this definition. So if it's if W is G3 of Y, that's the same thing as G3 of G2 inverse of G1 <laughs> of X. Or in other words, yeah, W is this group element. We know that this is a group element because a group is closed, right? So if G3 times G2 inverse times G1, that just gives us some other element of the group. This is some other element of the group acting on X gives us W.
what I'm trying to say is that if, if W is in the orbit of Y, then there's some group element that maps X to W. So, so then W is also in the orbit of X. And because this is such a general statement, W is any random element in the orbit of Y. And if any element's in the orbit of Y, then it's in the orbit of X. What that tells us is that the orbit of Y is a subset of the orbit of X. And then you just, you just reverse this logic starting at, at this point. When you have G1 of X equals G2 of Y, if now you say that X is G1 inverse G2 of Y, and then go through this process by letting W be in the orbit of X, you could also then show that the orbit of X is a subset of the orbit of Y. And because these are subsets of each other, that means that the orbit of X is equal to the orbit of Y, and therefore not only is an element of the set belonging to at most, or no, at least one partition, or sorry, sorry, at least one orbit, it's also belonging to at most one orbit, and therefore, therefore the orbits of a given action end up partitioning X. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. And, and again, notice that we're not saying anything about the sizes of the orbits. The, the orbit of X, the, the, the size of the orbit of X does not need to equal the size of the orbit of Y. Uh, maybe what you can, it's like if we're imagining like the orbits of planets, one planet could potentially have a smaller orbit than another planet at this point, right? That, that's all we're saying. We're not saying that different elements need to, that these boxes need to have the same size, right? But anyways, uh, this is going to be useful for, for the, the final part to, to finish off the video, which is going to be the orbit stabilizer theorem. So I think what I'm going to do is I will erase the board, except just, just for this statement, just so we, we're, we have this fresh in our heads that the orbits of an action partition of set. So I'll write out the orbit stabilizer theorem right here, and then we'll prove it to finish off the video. Okay, now kind of to the big theory of the, the, the final result. Uh, in this video that we've been working up to called the orbit stabilizer theorem. Simply put, if we have a group acting, a group G acting on a set X, then the order of the group is equal to the size of the orbit of an element times the size of the stabilizer of an element. And hence the, the phrase orbit stabilizer theorem. You take the size of the orbit, size of the stabilizer, that gives you the order of the group. Let's prove this. Proof. Now, hopefully this, this brings some sort of familiarity bells in our head with Lagrange's theorem, right? Let's quickly write down what, what Lagrange's theorem told us. Lagrange's theorem told us that if we had a group G and a subgroup H, then the order of the group was equal to the order of the subgroup H times the index of H, which we wrote as this, right? Or in other words, the number of left cosets of H in G, right? So, so it has this very similar structure, and to even connect the dots further, notice that we, we've already established that the stabilizer of, an, of a set element is a subgroup of G. So all we have to do is, is to replace H with the, the stabilizer. So actually, well, real, real quickly, let me, let me do that. So rather than writing the order of H, let's write out the order of the stabilizer of some elements, since we know the stabilizer is a subgroup, right? And maybe just so you can write that, we, we've shown that in this video. So then the number of left cosets would become, if we would just replace H with stab of X, become this, right? And what I, I want to make sure that we're, we're clear up until this point, this is already an established result. This is Lagrange's theorem. This is what we have shown already earlier on the video series. So we know this to be valid. This is, this is a true statement. What we are trying to show or what we do not know 
is true currently is this top statement. So what we would have to ask ourselves is, if we know this is true, under what conditions would this top statement also be true? Kind of just by looking at it, we say, okay, both have an order of G on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, both have a factor of the order of the stabilizer of an element. But the thing that seems to differ up until this point is, is these two key components right here. And the top line, we have that the size of the orbit of an element, or of orbit of x. And on the right-hand side, it seems like we have this quantity right here, the index of the stabilizer of an element in G. So the, the logic here is that if we are able to show that this statement is true, then the orbit stabilizer theorem, which is this guy, will naturally just fall into place from Lagrange's theorem. Okay. So now this is going to be our new goal, to show that this has the same, the orbit of an element has the same size as this index right here. And maybe just take a minute real quick to, to imagine how initially unintuitive this might be. Okay. When we are looking at this, the, the number of, this is the number of left cosets of the stabilizer uh, uh, in G, right? So basically, if we had a set of all of the left cosets, then, then elements of, of this right-hand side right here would have the form of some group element, little g, times the, the subgroup. Normally, we'd write it like g times h to denote a left coset, right? But, but we're going to replace h with the specific subgroup we're working with, the stabilizer of x. So elements of this right-hand side are going to have this form. And again, the, the stabilizer of x is a subgroup of a group. So, so this is like a group element times a bunch of group elements. So this right-hand side, what I'm trying to say, is going to be looking at group elements or products of group elements. Whereas the left-hand side, the orbit of an element is inherently a subset of X. It's not a subset of a group. So the left-hand side is looking at set elements. The right-hand side is looking at group elements. And we're saying that for whatever set element you choose, this statement is going to be true. The number of... Uh, set elements in here is going to be the number of left coset group elements, I guess, over here. It's a connection that we initially would not make at all because we're working with fundamentally different objects. After all, this is all very general, right? We have some group G acting on some set X. G and X do not need to be inherently related in any way, shape, or form. But it seems like there's this interesting connection that can be made. So now the, 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 the question is, okay, well, if this is what we want to show, how, how do we do that? And the way that we can do that is to say that if this, if, uh, this side, or if this set has a certain size, and if this set has a certain size, this being the set of left cosets, then there should be some sort of bijective function that exists between them. And that's going to be our goal. That's going to be the strategy. If we can construct a bijective function between these two sets, then they have to have the same size, okay? So let's go about doing that. And, and to, to prove this too, rather than just guessing and checking functions, that would take forever, right? I, I'm simply going to write out a, a function. I'm gonna call it theta. And theta is going to act as our bijective function going from, we're gonna call this our domain. So going from the set of left cosets, G stab of X, into the codomain, which is going to be the orbit of X. Okay, and and the specific action, or, or I said that I should say the specific, uh, the way that theta acts is it, it will take in an element of the domain, and what do elements of the domain look like? They're gonna look like this, right? So it's gonna have some group element. So theta is gonna have some group element, g times stab of x. And then it's going to output it into the codomain. And the way that it's gonna act is we're gonna say that it's going to equal g of x, like this. So this is what theta takes as an input and this is what it spits out as an output. 
And the goal here is to show that theta is a bijective function. So first thing that we're gonna do is, we, we could say that we just made this up, right? And in theory, like Dexter came up with this or whoever taught Dexter came up with this or whoever taught the person who taught, the person who taught Dexter came up with this. <laughs> but, but somebody came up with this and we would like to show that this wasn't just uh, this arbitrary mapping that may or may not even be well defined in the first place. Whenever we, we just kind of pull something out of thin air, we wanna show that it's well defined in the first place. And the way that we do that is that if two elements in the domain are equal, then two corresponding elements in the codomain also need to be equal. Okay. So, so let's do that. So let's, let's start by saying I have two elements in the domain that are equal. And I'll, I'll do that almost out of room, but I'll, I'll do that down here. So two elements in the domain of theta are going to be two left cosets that are going to be equal to each other. Let's call the first left coset g times stab of x. And let's call the, the second left coset h times stab of x. So the idea here is that both g and h are going to be elements of the group g. Okay. Now, if, if this is true, then what, what we inherently know is, is that this is going to be some, oh, this is going to be a subgroup times, uh, what am I trying to say? This is a group element times a subgroup and a group element times a subgroup. Basically, if I went element by element through each of the elements in stab of x, what I could show is that g times maybe k1 is equal to h times k2. Where, uh, Basically what I'm saying is, if, if this equation is true, and this is our starting assumption for being a well-defined function, if this equation is true, then g, g times some element of the stabilizer is going to equal h times some other element of that same stabilizer. So in this case, both k1 and k2 are elements of the stabilizer of x. And what we would like to show is that if, if these are equal, then corresponding elements in the codomain are equal. In other words, if these are equal, then g of, x, or g of x ultimately needs to equal h of x. Because that's what theta takes the left coset and maps it to, right? So that result over here is ultimately what we're trying to show. Now, if this is true, and if we were to go element by element through the stabilizer, what we could do is, is we could just take... Uh, multiply both sides on the right of this equation down here by k1 inverse. And if we do that, we get k1 inverse, k1 inverse. The k1 times k1 inverse cancels and we get that g equals hk2 k1 inverse. Now, what, we, what I'd like to do at this point is now that we have this relation, let's act both sides of the equation on the element little x and see what we get. So, so now I'm gonna take the left-hand side, g, and act it on x. And I wanna take the right-hand side, which is gonna be h, k2, k1 inverse, and act it on x. Now, uh, can't really manipulate the left-hand side any further, right? So we just have g of x. But what's gonna be this right-hand side, right? First, we have k1 inverse of x. But inherently, from this starting assumption, this starting equation right here, we know that k1, and therefore k1 inverse, is an element of the stabilizer of x. So what does that tell us about how k1 inverse acts on x? Well, it keeps x stable, it keeps x fixed. So, so it will not change x after we take k1 inverse and act it on x. What I'm trying to say is that k1 inverse of x equals x. And then you can make the same exact logic for k2. Because k2 is in the stabilizer, k of x, then k2 of x is x. It keeps x fixed. So this whole quantity, k2, k1 inverse of x, because this is in the stabilizer, doesn't do anything and just keeps it as x. So therefore, g of x equals h of x. And that's good because that's what we were trying to show in order to first say that theta was well-defined. 
right? If two elements in the domain are equal, then the two corresponding elements in the codomain are equal. Right. So that is the, the well-defined part. Now, so, so all that tells us is that theta is some well-defined function. But we don't just want any well-defined function, any sort of arbitrary mapping. We want the function to be a bijective function, because after all, that's going to be what, what tells us that the size of the orbit is equal to the size of the number of left cosets, or the number of left cosets. Okay. Now, it looks like I'm out of room. So what I'm going to do is, what do I want to erase? <laughs> um, I really, as, as much as I want to make this clean, I think each of these steps are important to have so we see the logic. So I'm going to erase, I think, whatever I feel like is allowable to erase. And then we'll finish off the video by showing that theta is, in fact, a bijective function. All right, now just to finish off the video to show that theta is a bijective function. First thing we need to do, well, I guess we need to show that it's both injective and surjective. It doesn't really matter which one we choose first. Usually we start with the injective one, though. And the, maybe I'll, I'll do that up here. The injective requirement says that if we have two elements of the codomain that are equal, so maybe let me just write this real quick. If we have two elements of the codomain, or elements of the orbit of X, and I can call those both, I guess, G of X and H of X, if it is an injective function, we want to therefore show that the corresponding elements of the domain are equal, right? So the left coset G stab of X should equal the corresponding left coset H stab of X. This is what we want to show. Now, starting here with our starting, uh, or given assumption, if g of x equals h of x, what we can do is we can take both sides of this equation, I guess, apply a factor of h inverse. So then the left-hand side becomes g h inverse of x equals h h inverse of x, or just x by itself. And that's really important because we have some group element, g h inverse, acting on x and stabilizing it. It, does, it keeps x fixed. So what this tells us is that the quantity g h inverse is in the stabilizer of x. And I, I believe we talked about this at some point, and, and we implicitly, I guess we went through kind of the steps in showing that it's well-defined, but you can go from this, this line by itself immediately to, to saying that this is an equivalent condition to this. And the, the general statement, I believe, when we first started talking about left cosets is that if we have one left coset, AH, and that's equal to another left coset, BH, then you can multiply a factor of B inverse on both sides, and you get AB inverse H equals H. Or another way of saying that is that AB inverse is in H. Then you just reverse the, pro the, the steps, and then you, you get what we're trying to show. We have AB inverse in H right here by saying that GH inverse is in the subgroup. Work your way up to show that the left coset G stab of X is equal to the other left coset H stab of X. Because of that, we know theta is an injective function. Hopefully, that makes sense. Now, we, we just need to show that it is surjective, and then we're going to be done. So, if a function is surjective, that means that every that for every element that we have in the codomain, that it gets mapped to by some corresponding element in the domain. Okay. So, so let's just take a look at some element in our codomain, which is going to be the orbit of x. So let's say that we have some y in the orbit, some codomain element, which we can call y, in the orbit of x. And if y is in the orbit of x, what, what does that tell us? Well, that tells us that y is one of the possible places that x, I guess, can orbit to, or, or one possible way that it can get mapped to. More mathematically, we can say that there is some group element g, which when acting on x, produces y. Right? And, and from here, we're, we're almost 
basically done because the same G, whatever group element acts on X to produce Y, this arbitrary codomain element, we can just set that G to be the same uh, corresponding uh, G that is in the domain. So that every codomain element has a corresponding domain element that maps to Y. Let's just write that out to be, to be more specific. So we know that if theta inputs G stab of X, then we get G of X. But if G of X is equal to Y, which is some codomain element, then, and this is an arbitrary codomain element, we're saying that any element in the codomain gets mapped to by whatever G stab of X is in the domain, provided that G is the element which takes an X and spits out Y. Therefore, theta is also surjective. And then again, just to, to go all the way back full, full circle, since theta is injective and surjective, it is bijective. And because it is bijective, size of this is the same as the size of this. And because the two sizes are the same, then it's just a natural extension of Lagrange's theorem to say that, that uh, let's see, where is Lagrange's theorem? Did I erase Lagrange's theorem? I somewhat erased it, but we, uh, let's, let's see. There's so many lines here, right? This is orbit stabilizer. No, this is, this is Lagrange's theorem. This is Lagrange's theorem. Okay. It's been a long couple hours of recording. Uh, my brain's starting to get fried, right? Uh, but, but essentially, we, we, can, we can simply say that, that this has the same, uh, we, we know that this is true since this is the same size as this. Therefore, this also has to be true. Therefore, the orbit stabilizer theorem is true. <laughs> Sorry, I got a little messy at the end, but, but hopefully the, the mathematical steps and everything leading up to that makes sense. Okay. Um, I, I should call it for this video. I mean, the, we, we could go into examples of applying the, the orbit stabilizer theorem. Maybe just one quick thing I'll say to, to see why this is useful. Let's box it to, this is the main result of the video, right? Is this provides a really interesting way of, of finding the order of a group. Let's say that we have some group G and, and, and that corresponds to a set of symmetries. And we wanna know how many symmetries are associated uh, with maybe a given object. And, and Dexter in his notes uses the example of a pyramid. Like if somebody were to ask you, what, what are all the symmetries of a pyramid? We might not know off the top of our head, but, but what you can do as, as a means of finding the left-hand side, is, is this interesting alternative. You have just some, you just say you have some group acting on a set, and then you pick a convenient element, because X is just an arbitrary set element, right? You pick an element where it's relatively easy to find both its orbits and stabilizers, and, and then you just compute the, the size of both of these quantities right here, multiply them together, and that is a means of, of computing the order of a group. It's an indirect way I shouldn't say indirect, but it's just a new way of, of finding sizes of uh, potential, or poten potentially uh, groups that we're not familiar with, and, and that's probably one of the main uses for it. Okay. Now, I'm, I'm gonna call it for this video, but uh, thanks so much for watching. We're gonna move on to, to looking at some group actions, specific types of group actions, now that we have this, this uh, important theorem established in the upcoming videos. So yeah, thanks so much for watching and I will see you guys in the, in the next one.